Right, so I'm now live. Um, so while everyone joins, hopefully very soon, uh, this is my very first um, Instagram live video. And um, uh, I'm going to be having a chat with, with Asif Karim, uh, who was the former uh, Kenyan uh, international, uh, captain the country as well in, uh, in, in the World Cup in 99 and had the honor of playing in three World Cups. So, so I'm, gonna jo I'm gonna invite him uh, to this uh, to this video, and I'm really excited uh, to have this chat with him. So, uh, I'll be joining in um, any second, and let's see how this goes. I'm really excited. There we go. I think he's joining now. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you, Asif Uncle? I'm fine, thank you. How are you all there? Good, good. Thank you for uh, for making the time. I'm really excited for this chat. No, you're most welcome. You've been doing a, a good job. I've followed some of the interviews that you have done. And Thank I think uh, this is a good effort that you put in. And I hope you can continue uh, pursuing this passion that you Thank have. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, I appreciate that. Perfect. So, <clears throat> so um, I want to keep today's, today's chat mainly focused around the three World Cups that you played in. Uh, 96, 99, and 2003. And I believe, you know, each one of them... Obviously, they're special, but for you personally, they're special because, uh, you know, the West Indies win in 96 that kind of announced Kenya uh, on, the, on the cricketing map, I guess. And then in 99, you captained the, the Kenyan team in the World Cup in England. And then in 2003, obviously, the, that game against Australia and obviously making it to the semifinals of the World Cup. So let's, let's go back to 96. Um, I think it was February 96. Um, against the West Indies, you know, Richie Richardson wins the toss and asks Kenya to bat. I think you guys put up about 167 or 166, I think. Tell me, tell me how, what was the atmosphere in the change room when you went in? Obviously, you never expected uh, to win that game, right? Of course. So I mean, no. Uh, the discussion in the change room. Now you're defending 167. Well, let me go one day before the, the match. We had right. just flown in from uh, Patna. Uh, but now we went to Delhi. Right. From Delhi, we had to go to Mumbai and then drive to Pune because that's where the match was. And so we got there in the evening of the eve of the match. Uh, normally, you get a day or two before so that you can go on the ground, uh, have a couple of net ses uh, sessions, look at the right. wicket, feel the atmosphere. Uh, and as far as that match was concerned, there was none of that. We got uh, to the hotel at about 6, 7 in the evening. Right. Uh, very brief uh, team meeting and the team was announced and so of course uh, next morning we we go on the ground uh, you know the, the, the I mean it was just a novelty to be on that ground because these are uh, superstars that you've been following from the 70s and the 80s that you've been hearing about West Indies and yeah. then you got the names of Richardson and Lara, Courtly Ambrose, uh, Chandapol and, and the likes all of them were there. So, of course, we went in the morning, uh, did our warm-ups. We were more looking at them than warming up, if you know what I mean. <laughs> wow. Watching what they were doing and how they were training. And I personally noticed something was not right in the team. Uh, the body language in the West Indies team was not looking good. Uh, and I sensed that something was not right there. But anyway, it was just uh, by the way then. So, we, we, as you rightly said, uh, Richie Richardson wins the toss and puts us into bat. And that, first of all, was a huge surprise. Yeah. Because we would have expected them to bat, treat it as a practice, uh, get some big score and, 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 and skittle us out quick. Anyway, so we go into the bat. And like any other match, the key that we were discussing every time that we must bat 50 overs, irrespective of what we score. Because if right. you bat 50 overs, you're going to get close to 200 plus in the worst case scenario. Yeah. So I think we batted just short of 50 overs. I think uh, I got out in the last uh, over and we got about 166, as you mentioned. So we go into lunchtime. I'd already injured my knee very, very badly against Australia a couple of matches before. And I was actually pushed into playing that match because that was uh, something that there's always a back of the mind that the spin attack, the West Indies may struggle. Right. So we go into lunchtime and of course we're all uh, discussing, you know, what do you think is going to happen? People were very casual about the whole thing, uh, thinking that we did decent getting about 160, 170 against the world champions. And so we were discussing among some of the players to say, how many overs do you think these guys uh, should be able to finish the game? 
So some can be 30 and 35 and 40 overs. I said, great. So the earlier they finish, the better. Because right. we've not been to Pune before. We haven't seen the city. <laughs> so let's finish the game. So evening we, yeah. can, we can go around and, uh, you know, we'll do our best what we can on the ground. But the moment the game finishes, we go back to the hotel and then we'll just, you know, uh, enjoy the city and, and see what else can be done. So we go into the field. Normal, uh, I think. Uh, Rajab uh, opens the bowling with Martin Suji as usual, our formidable opening bowlers that we had then. And Rajab strikes very early and gets Richie Richardson first wicket. So of course there was excitement, but you know just the normal excitement that okay yeah. we got one wicket, so good we are not losing by ten wickets right. now. And then Martin Suji gets the next wicket, and then comes the superstar Brian Lara uh, onto the wicket. Uh, and so of course first ball. Uh, he cover drives Raja majestically, you know. I saw and, that. Uh, I just watched it the other day, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, right. That was a, an exciting shot. Uh, a couple of balls, he struggles. One over later, uh, they go through the, the same thing. Then Raja comes in again, the, his uh, next over. And I think it was the second or third delivery. And he played a very flashy shot, I thought. And gets a fine uh, uh, nick. And uh, uh, I would say grabbed by Tariq Iqbal at the back because he was having a disaster of a game. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, saw, I remember the bye. The game, the, yeah. yeah, I mean, the balls were going through his, uh, his uh, in between his legs and very, very unusual. And Tariq was, is, a, is a very good keeper I mean, that we had. And of course, uh, that catch, uh, I think, was clearly the defining moment where the entire team and the management believed that uh, there is something we can do here. You know, this is a door opening. And I think if we put some more pressure uh, with the spin attack coming in and we can uh, hold our, our field well, right. we may be in for a huge surprise. The world may be in for a huge surprise. And then as we say, the rest was history. I mean, what happened was phenomenal. And then we became uh, CNN news. And in those days, it was a big deal, you know, 25 right. years ago. Uh, so it was a huge thing that happened. and. Um, we enjoyed every moment of it. I mean, the, the boys were fired up. The team was fired up. The crowd was amazing because we had a lot of Kenyans uh, in the crowd, uh, mostly students, because there were a lot of Kenyans uh, uh, studying in India uh, in university. So there was a big uh, crowd that had come. And of course, there were quite a few from Burhani Sports Club in Mombasa. Uh, wow. And few of his uh, colleagues were there who had also come to the, to the game and we right. gave them the tickets. So it was a great feeling. Then we had a good uh, lap of honor at the end. And then, of course, there were interviews after interviews and photographs after photographs. And then the whole Kenyan contingent, the uh, spectators came to the hotel. So it was a wonderful I, day. No, I, it's, it, I think that's, for me, that was probably the defining moment for Kenyan cricket. I mean, it just took off from Indeed. there. Um, and, and, and then, obviously, 96, then comes 99. Now, for you personally, 99 was huge because you were given the honor to captain the team. Um, unfortunately, you know, I think it was five games. Kenya wasn't able to win uh, any of them. Why do you think that was? Was it the conditions playing in England? Was it foreign to, to, to the Kenyan team? Well, you know, I know most people believe that winning uh, means you have done well. Uh, that's a normal way. But, you know, I, for Kenya being a young cricketing nation, uh, who had just made a mark uh, a couple of years back and we got our ODI status in 97 along with Bangladesh. And, uh, and playing in England in, in early uh, summer, rather it was spring, I think it was, it was end of uh, April, early May. And it's quite cold at that time. In fact, when we landed in Manchester, it was snowing, uh, wow. middle of April. So I don't think most of us were used to the, playing those kind. In fact, 90% of the team had never been to England let alone play in England. Uh, so the conditions were quite harsh for us. Our spin attack was very important. Uh, the 30-35 overs, if you look at the statistics, in, in uh, the spin attack played a very crucial role uh, for our bowling attack after our batting doing very well. Now there the spin attack was completely uh, of no significance. Even holding the cricket ball was difficult because it was so cold. Mm. Uh, and for those who in those cold conditions will understand how tough it is. Uh, I thought we played uh, well. We, our matches were competitive. In fact, when the manager was at the end, 
gave us statistics that we scored more runs in England than we did in India. Wow. You know, so yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that was his statistics. But having said that, most people prefer that when you win a match or when you win matches, that's when you've done well. But I'm saying right. as a young nation that Kenya was in, uh, being competitive was number one important. We did not want to be outplayed. We wanted uh, for people to feel that we are there to remain. And that was critical for the team. Right. What was your experience like? I mean, obviously, as a captain, you know, before the World Cup started, you you probably, you know, had, had a dinner or something with all the other captains. I remember you showing me that, I was seeing that picture even online with all the other captains. I think Arjuna, Hansi, no, not Arjuna, but Hansi was there, uh, Azaruddin was there. What was that experience like just being in that elite company of, of these people who, uh, these are household names in world cricket? Well, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, playing cricket in England is, is the ultimate. You know, as they always say, that's the mecca of cricket. Right. Uh, so there was a captain's meeting at Lords, uh, and now going to Lords in itself is a novelty. Right. Uh, so we had all the, the 12 captains there from Steve Waugh, Wasim Akram, Azaruddin, Arjuna, uh, Alex Stewart from England. Uh, then we had uh, Hansi Cronier from South. And so, of course, that was a wonderful experience uh, sharing, uh, you know, uh, shoulder to shoulder with them, exchanging a lot of information on the conditions. Uh, they wanted to know about how Kenyan cricket was doing because, you know, we had all of a sudden became a name that people did not want to take us for granted. Remember a year before, we also beat India in India. In India, so, yes. You know, yes. So, you know, that is, so all of a sudden, you know, Kenyan was putting a mark uh, and so, of course, there were uh, scouting, if you want to call that, for information on how the team was doing and how has been our experience. And so it was quite a uh, wonderful uh, uh, experience, and that's something I treasure to date. Absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll forward a little bit to uh, 2003, which I think is your personal favorite. Um, <laughs> now, before, before we come to, um, to the game against Australia, which was in the later, the later half of the World Cup, uh, what was the mood like uh, going into that World Cup? I know Kenya was hosting, supposed to host a couple of games. One, I think, that didn't end up happening. But what was that like? Because you came out of retirement um, to, to play in that World Cup. So what was the build-up like uh, to the 03 World Cup? Well, it was very interesting because, as you said, I came back from retirement. Now, from 99, when I retired, at, at that time, uh, if I can just go a little bit back so that I put you in the perspective of yeah. how we go to 2003. Now, you know, as you rightly said, we did not win. So in a lot of mindset was that when you don't win, the captain is to be blamed or the team is not good enough or the performance was not good enough. So there was a lot of uh, loose talks uh, that had uh, started uh, talking. And I also felt that before the World Cup that, you know, uh, I would want to finish on a high, play 20 years for the country play the World Cup, lead the nation at, uh, in England. And, uh, and then when this buzz started, the, I decided uh, that it's better I retire. And a lot of people were against the decision of my retirement. Uh, but I, I, I knew myself what the situation was and how the situation was going. Uh, and I always believed that it's better to be asked, why are you retiring instead of when are you retiring? You know, mm. that one word changes the whole meaning. Absolutely. It was a very tough decision. It was extremely tough uh, because I knew that I was still needed in the team because this was a, a young team that needed some experienced leadership to keep the people together. Because remember, we had a cross section of people in the team. You had uh, Asians, first of all, then in the Asians, you had the Hindus and the Muslims. Then in the Africans, you had different tribes. Mm. Then you had people who are fortunate to be educated and unfortunate some were not educated. Now to balance the entire group and to keep it going at that international level, when all the eyes are you on television was a task in itself, you know, yep. to put everybody together outside the cricket ground, motivating everybody, putting them together, making them believe that they could do. So it was a lot of work that was, that was required. And I felt I should have continued, but the situation did not uh, compel it. So I did retire and I went on with my uh, business life and other things. And occasionally I played some club cricket. Now, in between, the team started having a lot of problems. There were a lot of undercurrent problems. There was a problem on leadership. There was a lot of problem in the management. And just about six or eight weeks before the 2003 World Cup, the chairman of selector, Asif Padamshi, called me and, and uh, requested me 
to make a comeback. So I first of all asked him, come back to what? You want me to manage the team? What do you want me to do? He says, no, 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 I want you to play in the team. Ah. I said, you must be joking. Because you know, I said, I haven't you know, played for four years uh, any cr cricket. He says, no, your presence is what is required right now because of what was happening. So of course, of course I had to do a lot of thinking because I had to mentally prepare myself on this, emotionally prepare myself on this, and more importantly, physically prepare myself because you're not just going there on a holiday. You're going there for a mission and, and Kenya was important that we make a mark to make sure that the world cricket believes in Kenya cricket and that we are there to remain. So being that being the background, I, of course, then uh, consulting uh, my family, close friends, uh, and of course, it was an exciting at the end of the day that you are now going back to play a World Cup. And I always say that any professional cricketer, if you have not played a World Cup, you have not completed your cricket. So we were very fortunate, you know, now this is my third World Cup. Uh, the board, the same board that did not support in 99 is the same board that came back to say that, right. please, we would need your help. So for me, that was a victory in itself. So anyway, we go to the, to the 2003 World Cup. Uh, some matches were being played in Kenya. We had a terrible outing uh, in the beginning against South Africa. We then beat Bangladesh, uh, Canada. And then we came back and, and had a huge win against uh, the former world champion Sri Lanka at home. Yep. So again, the sense of belief became quite big. And then we were to play Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh and Kenya have arch rivals on the field for for good number of years, you know, because right. both were competitive and both wanted to make a mark at international level. So we beat them also, you know, and then had a, a very close uh, uh, loss against India in the Super Six before we were thrashed against uh, West Indies. We, but because of the points we carried in the beginning rounds, we managed to go into the Super Six, and and that was very critical. So in the Super Six, we had to win one match either against Zimbabwe, uh, uh, India, or Sri Lanka, though one of the matches, to qualify into the semis. Right. And so we beat Zimbabwe for the first time at the, the international level. I played against them in 1980, you know, and so it was good to finish. I mean, they thrashed us in those days. And then to come and beat them in, in, in a World Cup to get to the semifinals. And then came the big game uh, that people do talk about against Australia. Now... Before, before, before we dwell into the game, um, there was one question here asked by Shani Abbas in London. Uh, were, were there any, any issues between team members? Like, um, you know, like maybe some of, the, some of the top names in the team, like Kennedy Otieno at the time, Maurice Odumbe. Um, you know, was, was there any, any um, personal rivalries between or any, any drama between team members? Uh, during the tournament? Uh, no, even before. Just overall. No, yeah, yeah. There, there was, in fact, absolutely. There was a lot of problems before the tournament. That's why I was called in. Because uh, there was a lot of undercurrent between the uh, Steve Ticolo uh, and the people under him. And so there was a lot of bickering going on. They had a terrible uh, uh, trip to Zimbabwe uh, in December right. uh, of 2002, where, uh, you know, there were some serious accusations on match fixing, there was serious accusation on performance, there was serious accusation on behavior. And Sandeep Patil was the coach. And so, of course, he was also consulted. So it was a huge relief for him when I even accepted to come in. So it kind of neutralized uh, the whole scenario because it was important that they needed somebody to kind of calm down uh, things. Right. Of course, everybody was not happy with my presence there uh, because you know I was also quite strong in, in my own views and my, my own character. So you know, everybody had to uh, put their, their checks and balance properly because at the end of the day, the most important thing was that Kenya cricket must do well. These opportunities don't come daily. Right, of course. Now, coming to the game itself, uh, I remember when we tested this video, this video chat yesterday, I'd asked you a question and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask it again for the benefit of those who are watching. Uh, Brett Lee at the time was at the peak of his bowling power like he was bowling close to 100 miles an hour every delivery and now here we have Ravindu and Kennedy and and these guys who have to open the batting to face him was there any any apprehension because I'm sure the, the Kenyan openers or even the top order hadn't faced somebody bowling at that pace what was um what was it like before the game knowing that somebody or some some players are gonna have to face Brett Lee 
Well, as I said earlier, we had already qualified for the semifinals. So that game in, in, in theory was just a formality. But of course, right. when you're playing Australia, uh, it's very rare, first of all, to get an opportunity to play them. Uh, and then to get people uh, to, to face uh, people like Brett Lee or McGrath, uh, you know, is, is all, again a, a very huge novelty because when else will you get that opportunity? Right. But of course, like, like uh, all uh, cricketers are not the same. Some players did chicken out. Uh, they wow. felt they did not want to take a risk of right. playing that game in case they got injured and there's a semi finals coming up. Well, which well, is again. Can you say? I, I would, I'd leave that to for the, once you look at the scorecard, <laughs> you see who's not playing, okay. you, you might be able to figure out who. So we'll compare it with the other game, with the next game maybe. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right, okay, okay, go on. So, yeah. But having said that, we had also some excellent cricketers in the team who I regard some of them as world-class players who could have played at any test team level or at, at any of the top countries. I mean, you have players like Ravindu Shah, I think he's a class act. Absolutely. I mean, if you if you look at his uh, inning against uh, Brett Lee, he I think he hit him three fours in one over, uh, and he he he's a majestic a class bat. We had uh, Kennedy got injured from uh, Brett Lee, and he had to uh, yeah, that was a Brett Lee bouncer. Yeah, yeah. He, he badly injured his uh, elbow, and we in fact we got worried that he may not even be able to play the semi-finals, but he was okay then. So there were some players who took it as an opportunity, who took it as a challenge. And uh, they'll thrive on such things. And, and uh, I think we did well because we bet at 50 overs. As I said earlier, our one mission that we always said, we must bet 50 overs irrespective of the situation. Right. No, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, then came, then came the, the second half of the game. Everybody's watched that, that clip. Everybody has, has watched your spell. There's one question I have about this spell, and that is what... I, I watched even the ball to ball. I've seen your entire spell, every single delivery. The wicket of punting, which I think will stand out for you as well, out of the three that you took, was that planned? Because even the commentator said that you spun a few away from him and then you got him with the one that went straight on. So was that was that planned or? Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I came to bowl, I think there were about 110 for two, I think, or 15 overs, you know, so they needed about another 60 odd runs. So uh, it was more like a formality. So, you know, when I came in, I, it was a water break. So I came in the 16th over, I think. Uh, I bowled the first ball, he played it down. I bowled the second one, it turned. And he was beaten. I think he was even dropped, I think, uh, by Ravi. Yeah. yeah. Now, this, this was my third time playing at Kingsmead. Uh, and the previous two times I had played, I had excellent figures on the ground. So when I bowled that second one and I saw a turn on that wicket, I'm a competitor. I'm not going to just let it go. So I said to myself, I'm going to make the most of this. I'm going to not just go through motions just to go through this. Let me give it my best shot and see what I can, you know, try and put right. pressure. So I kept putting pressure on him. And I saw him struggling. The third ball, if you look at him, the fourth ball, he kind of padded and, and struggled. So I said, let me bowl him in the fifth one as an arm ball and see what happens. And, and, uh, and that's the history. The impact of the wicket was not only the, the delivery, but to plan that to come to that fifth delivery to get him. You right. see the four balls, he struggled. It was a struggle for him. And so on the fifth ball, you know, that kind of cemented the entire uh, wicket, if you want to talk about the whole wicket on Ricky Ponting. So wow. that was extremely special because I think he was one of the number one uh, batsmen in the world. You know, uh, that I mean, he was scoring hundreds at ease, the Australian <laughs> captain. Yeah, and then when you see what he did in the finals yeah. against, against the Indian attack, against the Indian spin, I think, I got, I think he got about 150 or well, yeah, 140, with I think. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah out. So, you know, so that was something uh, was pleasure. I mean, you know, it's uh, something uh, I treasure it to date. And Absolutely. many cricket fans, cricket fans around the world yeah. still acknowledge it. And many times I do get that message like I get it from you today. Obviously, after that game, you sort of, you know, were the talk of the conversation everywhere. And, all, you know, all the, there was a lot of credit going your way. Were there any players on the team who, 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 who didn't take that well? Was anyone who didn't want you to be in the World Cup at the time? Can you mention any names? I, I know it, it, it's, a, it's a weird question, but... Were there any people who perhaps didn't want you to come back into the team in 03, now seeing that you've become the center of attention? 
Yeah, well, it's a very good point, and it's a, it's a question not many have asked me that one. Uh, obviously, as I said earlier, that my presence was uncomfortable for some people because I will become a threat. Uh, to, in fact, there was even a conversation when uh, this talk came about putting me in the team, where uh, Steve was also trying to be a little difficult. Uh, okay. And uh, right. the selector said, well, if he's not interested, they can drop him and Asif will captain the team. That discussion even came in before the World Cup. And I told them, no, no, I'm not here to take anybody's position. I'm here to help. So, right. And it's not necessary that I have to play to help. I can be helping in the, in the changing room, in the team meetings, technical meetings, motivate the youngsters, because I think I have done enough uh, playing for the country. You know, 20 years is a long time. I right. enjoy it from the lowest to the highest. On the moment. But, you know, and as I said, yes, of course, many people were not comfortable. Uh, even when I got the man of the match, you could see there was a lot of discomfort wow. with some of the, the, the players uh, on the matter. But obviously, the, the euphoria was so much that I think between that match and the semi-finals against India, I must have done close to 50 interviews wow. from CNN to Sky to the Indian. I mean, you know, we were playing India the next. So the Indian media, as you know, how, how huge they are and how much uh, they, they follow. And they also had a lot of uh, fond memories with, uh, with Kenyan cricket because a lot of Indian cricketers have played in Kenya. Right. So I did a lot of it. I made the most of it. Let me put it that way. I made the most of it. I enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, and I still feel good about it when I, when I remember that. But yes, Excellent. it's not possible. It's not possible for everybody to like you. But right. that does not matter. As long as God is with you, that is the ultimate and well, that's what matters. And, and you said that in the, in the post-match interview as well, when you got the Man of the Match award. Um, obviously, at the time, Ponting is a household name, you know, he's a celebrity of the game. Did you have any interaction with him after? The reason I ask is because one of the reasons why I like Ricky Ponting or I like watching him was there's a certain arrogance that he carries himself with. Now, I don't know if it's an Aussie thing, but I've always enjoyed that. There's a certain arrogance that he has about him. Did you have any interaction with him after? Now that you got his wicket, um, it's a big deal for you. Uh, did you meet him after the game? Did you speak speak to him? I know you are an Aussie fan, uh, <laughs> so you will you will you will uh, protect him rather. Right. <laughs> but no, they they were they're quite candid after the game. I mean, you know, they're very competitive. You know, a lot of people uh, talk that Australians are too. Uh, rough and arrogant, all that. They are very competitive, is what I would say on the ground. You know, they're there to, to play, they're there to win. For them, winning is everything. You know, they're very tough in, in their performance. But after the game, uh, they're, they're totally different. I mean, uh, I met Ponting outside. In fact, the Buckner, if you remember, I don't know if you saw that clip, I was just walking back uh, after the game and he called me and gave me the stump and the cricket ball. Wow. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. So he, uh, Steve Buckner, in fact, he called me. So he gave me the stump and the ball. So when, after the changing room, as we were walking out, I gave Ponting the ball and I asked him to autograph the ball. So, wow. so he, yeah, he very kindly autographed that cricket ball. Uh, and of course, there was a good rapport. And once we went back to the hotel, after changing, we all met down uh, for a little social. And so it was, uh, it was quite uh, candid and they were very, very appreciative and complimenting on, on the whole Kenyan team and on how we had done in that World Cup. Uh, that's excellent. Um, uh, speaking of Ponting, you know, another player that obviously comes to mind is Sachin Tendulkar. Um, you played him the next game. Um, have you ever met him? Have you ever spoken to him? And how is he as a person if you've had a chance to meet him? Uh, of course, we, we do uh, meet when we are, we are playing the teams, but he's very reserved. He, he keeps him, himself to himself. We bumped into the elevator once we were, the two of us were in the elevator just before the, the game because th we were staying in the same hotel. Ah. So it was just a little, little pleasantry, but he's a man of few words, unless he's very comfortable or knows somebody very well, I think he's quite reserved. So, but he's very candid with his, uh, his own preparation. And I think he's more like uh, keeping to himself to prepare mentally, emotionally for the game to follow. Uh, right. That's what we were told that, you know, he's in his room, uh, he focuses on the team he's playing against, he, he concentrates on the strengths of the bowler, the weakness of the bowling. Uh, and so he mentally prepares himself before he goes out to play the next day. 
Wow, I'm sure that's something all of us can do when we go out, when we prep. Um, you played for Kenya, you know, for so long. Uh, did you make any friends off the pitch, like people that you, I guess, back in the day, maybe, maybe texting, but uh, till present day on WhatsApp, do you have any any friends that you keep in touch with that you played with on an international level? Uh, you know, in those days, uh, interaction with those big names was also not very easy. Uh, because, you know, everybody kept to themselves. Uh, after the game, the next day you leave, you know, you go to the next destination. Right. Uh, and, but whenever I have met them since then, like, you know, met a, a couple of cricketers in India, the relationship is very cordial. But I had a very uh, special relationship with uh, the former Sri Lankan captain, Arjuna Ranatunga. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. We, in fact, to date, we are in touch. Uh, and uh, if you remember in 2001, when India had the earthquake in Butch, uh, yeah. and at that time, we, yeah, we, yeah. we were trying to raise money and I called him to to come and play a game in Kenya and he, on the very first phone call, he supported, he came over, uh, we, we played a game and raised over $10,000 on that day where we gave uh, the funds to the Muslim community, to the Hindu community and to the Prime Minister Fund of India at that time. So yes, uh, uh, that repo is there. And whenever I do meet them, uh, it's always a very cordial and uh, respectful relationship. Excellent. But I, I, in fact, remember now, I have very, very cordial relationship with the Bangladesh cricketers, uh, ah, especially yeah. the ones that uh, I have played, you know, people like Atar Ali Khan, who is a renowned commentator right now. Uh, then uh, Habibul Bashar, uh, Minar Habibuddin Nannu, and quite a few other cricketers. So yes, there has been a, a good rapper. But it's unfortunate that because our cricket has gone down, our interaction right. also at international level has, has diminished. Because that also helps when you interact and play at that level on a regular basis. That makes sense. Um, I really want to ask you about uh, Maurice Odumbe. Uh, I, I came across an interview that he did with, with Jeff Koenange in, in Nairobi. And and he was was half the man he, he used to be. I mean, he had lost all that weight. He was he openly said that he was struggling financially. He was completely broke. Um, obviously, I'm sure the match fixing scandal hurt him. Um, but w what happened to him? Where is he now? Uh, well, you know, that, tell us a little bit about how he got to that low that he was in, um, and what's he doing now? Has has anyone tried to help him? to, I guess, uh, get him out of that, that low that he was in? You know, Maurice Odumbe, when I hear that name, you know, because I've inter played and interacted with him quite closely, because in when we used to tour uh, until the World Cup, or and then when we got the ODI status, you would kind of share rooms with your uh, right. teammates. So we were regular roommates, you know, when I was captain, he was the vice captain. When he was the captain, I was the vice captain. So we would, uh, and I've seen him in close quarters, I think he's one of the uh, finest cricketers this country has produced. Uh, and he's played a phenomenal uh, performance. I mean, I always uh, remind him, uh, and he, he gets quite uh, embarrassed when I tell him, that he performed for Kenya on different occasions, on different services. When I look at the ICC trophy for us to qualify for the World Cup, you know, the first one uh, he played was in 90 in Amsterdam, you know, where we played, uh, I think, under, under uh, Coyer Matting. Then in 94 in Nairobi in grass, then he played in AstroTurf in Malaysia and he dominated in batting. You know, he performed so well and he was a, a great all-rounder, very, very good spinner, uh, a fighter to the ground. And, uh, and, and he, is, he did proud to Kenya cricket. But it's very sad that he got into uh, what he did uh, because that was proven. So as much as anybody would like to deny or for himself to deny. I think it is wrong. I, and I told him many a times that the earlier you accept that you made the blunder, the world will respect you more. The more you are defending and, and, and blaming other people, it's making your case worse. Mm. You know? So he would kind of agree with me, but, but then he never did that. Uh, you know, the, the judge who, who found him guilty is a, is a very respectable person because it's Judge Ibrahim from Zimbabwe. When right. I first went to Kenya in 1980 to Zimbabwe, we were billeted to different houses and I stayed at Judge Ibrahim's house. Wow. He was at that time he was, he was a lawyer. So he was a very honorable man, uh, you know, and then he became a match referee and, and a very respectful uh, human being in Zimbabwe and in the world. 
for so somebody like him to find you guilty, I would have no hesitation but to accept that verdict. You know, and, the, and so I kept telling him that, but he kept resisting the matter. Of course, a lot of people uh, did help uh, Morris uh, because you know he carried the name, and but then you know he needed to help himself. Mm. Uh, there is so much somebody can do for you. You know, uh, there's a time comes when uh, what I call uh, uh, there is exhaustion of help. You know, there is there is uh, what I call uh, people get tired of of keep on you know uh, giving you handouts or helping out. The right. board also tried helping him. You know, they gave him a coaching job. Uh, he's been in and out of the system, but unless he gets his mental thing proper, uh, and and I would say I'm also disappointed with his family, because I don't think they really uh, uh, supported him. I mean, I know he's been to the rehab, he's been to uh, a lot of help, but he's struggling right now. It's very sad. It's very painful when I see him, the state he is in, uh, and of course I try and encourage him whenever I can or whenever he does speak to me. Uh, and and uh, he 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 has done a lot for Kenyan cricket, you know. So it's a shame that uh, he is where he is right now. And I hope that uh, some good can come out for, for him, uh, because I think he still has a lot to offer in terms of experience that he has gained over the years. And I'm sure he can do good for the youngsters because he still is a household name in Kenya. Where is where is Kenyan cricket now? Um, any any hope? You know, I was hoping you would not ask me that question because. <laughs> That's a that's a question I'm beyond exhaustion answering. Uh, uh, it's it's a very very sad and painful situation we are in. Uh, I mean I had an interview with ESPN Cricket Info a few years back with I think Tim Wigmore, uh, and and I said to him that Kenyan cricket is dead and buried. Uh, this I said in 2014 or 2015 I think around that time, and and it definitely indeed it is. You know right now we are in Division Three. We are still going further south. Uh, there are no structures. Uh, you have an illegal uh, uh, cricket body that's running. Um, the Nairobi Provincial, which most of the cricket is played here, it has no respect among the clubs. Right now, the clubs are organizing the cricket on its own without wow. the provincial body's blessings. And the cricket is running. It has no structures. We have almost non-existent development structure. We have very poor domestic cricket, and uh, I see a, a very, very bleak uh, future. But I'm more pained for the youngsters, because uh, you know these were the youngsters who looked up to the team that did well in the 90s and the early 2000s, right. and who wanted to emulate and you know maybe even further take the cricket out the way Bangladesh cricket has done. You know, yep. I mean, we were ahead of Bangladesh in our days. But look at how uh, they have risen uh, in their cricket. And whereas we have uh, plunged it completely. So a young cricketer has only a certain number of years, especially now when they can generate some money to survive. Now here you have money that has not been accounted for correctly. The days are passing by. The youngsters are losing out. There is no potential structure for us to play at a higher level. So uh, it, it's it's a very very uh, sad situation, and um, I think even God would struggle to help us right now. With wow, idea. I I know um, your son Irfan has taken up the sport obviously and has yep. played for Kenya. Given what you just explained, how are you are you help? Uh, is there anything you are able to do to help him um, progress as as a cricketer? Is there any uh, channels that you're trying to? To, to pursue uh, for him to progress his game in, in his game yeah first uh, I think he he's got good opportunities uh, a few years ago when he got admission at Loughborough University you know in UK right. which is one of the six MCC uh, academies where uh, they play at the highest level of cricket in England where a lot of cricketers then go to play county or for the England team in fact right. the England national team also uh, trains at Loughborough University so he was exposed to the good cricket. He played uh, the highest level of uh, university cricket. And uh, in one of the 2020 tournaments, uh, his university won the England tournament. So he went on to represent England in the World Cup in 2015, in uh, the University World Cup in uh, Dehradun, India. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they played extremely well, losing in the finals against South Africa, where he was declared uh, uh, the best batsman of the tournament, I think. In that tournament, he averaged close to 80. 
So he did very well. I was fortunate that I witnessed the tournament. I managed to do some commentating work also that in the tournament. And then he uh, has played at uh, the second counties in England. He's played at the Premier League uh, in England. So he has had that good exposure. Uh, but again, playing at that level is also not very easy. You know, the, the, you need to know uh, people to push you. You need a lot of networking. Uh, so we have tried uh, quite a bit. He's, he's got those good opportunities. And then when Kenya plays, he, he plays for them. But the motivation right now is so low. Uh, because right. when you're playing at Division 3, and you've got people who are not on the same page, uh, you know, with you, it becomes quite difficult. Of course, he's exploring uh, different uh, places. I'm also uh, trying to explore with my network, uh, trying to see if we can get to play some cricket in uh, India uh, and Sri Lanka. So it's a matter of time. Let's see what uh, transpires now that we are all um, locked down with the, the corona. Yeah. The priorities right now are different. Uh, and uh, so let's see with time. I hope that he gets that opportunity. He's very focused in his cricket. He's eating, he's sleeping, he's drinking cricket. So I hope that he gets that opportunity. Uh, uh, what his grandfather uh, did in the 50s and 60s in Mombasa. And then I managed to take it up and hopefully he can take it even higher. Um, uh, and make proud to his own cricket and feel satisfied with what he's doing. Absolutely. I, I can't believe we've, we've been speaking for 42 minutes. Um, oh. And that, that is that is excellent. I, I hope everyone uh, is enjoying the chat so far. And just as we conclude, um, you've been you've you've kept yourself pretty busy uh, with the um, on on a personal level. You're you're trying to publish, or I think you've already published the uh, the documentary, the uh, the the coffee the coffee table book that we talked about. Can you just for those watching, can you um, just tell us a little bit more about that and how they can get their hands on it? Yeah, this uh, idea came. Uh during uh, the several cricket tours that we had all over the world. And, uh, you know, when we were traveling there and you go to a bookshop or you come out of the airport and you see big posters and, and all that. So, you know, you realize that the sportsmen in that country were made to look larger than life. You know, they, they were made important and you kind of got intimidated because you are now used to those things. You know, you, you open the television and you see a, a commercial by Azaruddin or you see a commercial by Sachin and yep. all these other cricketers. So, you know, it was a lot of things. And then we saw magazines come out, you know, with their pictures and posters. And then you go to the bookshop, you see autobiographies and all that. So I said to myself that, you know, I had learned from my dad who had kept a very, very good record. You must have seen that, you know, he had a file uh, of newspaper cuttings from 1950, you know, up to the time he retired. Right. And then I took it up for my own file. And then now Irfan is doing his own bit. So I said, I have so much information. So I would like to write a book. Uh, you know, at the end, and just A, to honor my parents, and B, to, you know, keep something for posterity, and more importantly, for the next generation to see where we've come from and see how they can even take it to another level. So I wanted to do that post-99 retirement, but then I got uh, busy in other things in my business and other uh, avenues, so I took it as a back burner. But then 2010-11 is when I started, and as I was starting on the book, one of the Indian film uh, directors came to visit me. He was staying in Nairobi and he came up with this idea of a documentary. And of course, I laughed it out initially wow. because it was something very uh, unusual, you know, to, to hear that. And I said, I don't think, I think the book is good enough. He says, no, I think there's a story here and, and I would like to do it. So after a long uh, discussion and all that, he embarked on it. And then uh, the documentary was done. It's called The, the Kareem's A Sporting Dynasty. It's on YouTube. And it was then done with nine languages on subtitles. It's got wow. four Indian languages, yeah. It's got in Hindi, Punjabi, Gujarati, uh, Bengali, Gujarati, Hindi, and Punjabi. And then it's got in Arabic, Farsi, sign language, Swahili. Yeah, so, uh, wow. and, then, and that was all inspired after the documentary was shown in various film festivals. Uh, the first one was shown in India. Uh, and I was invited with uh, Nazdin to go there. Uh, and at that time, when I was watching that sports film festival and where this movie was actually premiered uh, in India, it was not premiered in Kenya. Uh, and I suddenly realized that, you know, these are some very good, uh, inspiring stories that we are watching. But Kenyans equally have good stories to do. So I said, once I finish the, the book, right. um, now that the documentary was in, I would like to do a sports film festival. So in 2017, when we launched the Coffee Table book, uh, incidentally, the, it's also a limited edition, but we are now looking at doing an EPUB, which is a right. new technology, which I'm sure you'll understand it better. 
<laughs> we're trying to right. uh, eat up. So hopefully, when it's ready, we will uh, let the viewers who are interested to read the book, or we can even do a print on demand in in uh, in in other countries. Right. Uh, on those, so that's something. That's a 350 page book. It's got about 800 photographs. The oldest being 1920, uh, and the latest being 2016, with the editorial of almost 150 years of uh, right. of uh, history that has come through. It's a it's a good uh, good read. It's good for records, and I'm hoping that uh, people who get an opportunity to go through the documentary or the book, the book is the longer version of the documentary. That they get inspired, and that, that hopefully that that here is a, a guy from Mombasa, uh, from the old town Kibokoni, as we say, uh, achieve what he has achieved. Then anybody else can equally do uh, same, if not better. Absolutely, um, you know, there's so much we can still talk about, but Instagram will cut us off in about ten minutes. Um, uh, thank you so much, Asif Uncle. I really appreciate you taking all this time and, and answering some of these questions. And I'm hoping the people who, who tuned in over the last 45 minutes uh, enjoyed uh, this discussion. And I'm hoping that we can do another one soon. I think hopefully um, once I, I get some feedback on how this conversation went and if there's more that people want to know uh, about your playing days or certain people in the team or whatever it is, um, we can we can certainly um, uh, do this again, and uh, again, thank you so much for for taking the time. And I hope uh, I really enjoyed the chat. Thank you, Asan. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Uh, it's it's a pleasure always. Uh, you know you, I know as a young uh, boy you were my big fan. I remember. Yes, uh, right here. I have <laughs> your jersey right here. So yeah. your '99 World Cup captain's jersey right there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You I were have one that of... right here. Absolutely. I'll need yeah. you to sign it for me one day, but hopefully once once uh, the self-isolation is over, we can get a chance to get together and you'll sign that for me and then I can frame it. So It'll be a <laughs> pleasure. So, you know, you, I remember you as a young kid coming home and, uh, you know, being excited to, to see what your uncle is doing. And so I appreciate uh, you and your brother, uh, yeah. Alija, who's also a big fan uh, of mine and, and always given me all the due respect, which I really appreciate from, from both of you. I wish you well also. Continue. Thank keep you. safe. And uh, let's pray that we all come out stronger from this. But more importantly, one message I would like to, to pass on on this corona. I think, uh, and I'm giving this message first to myself uh, than to anybody else, is I think it's a huge time for uh, self-reflection. Uh, I think it's, it's time, I think we've all been on, a, on what I call a super highway, where we've all been running, running, running. I don't know where we are going. And I think we lost some basic values of life. Uh, and I think it's time for us all to reflect and to see that we need to get to some basics uh, uh, in place and uh, try and see that we have more human element among ourselves where there's more harmony and there's more peace with one another. That sounds perfectly said. Thank you so much, Asif Uncle. I hope the viewers, I hope you all enjoyed uh, this discussion. And if you want more of it, please let me know and I'll I'll be happy to schedule something again with uh with with asif Agro. thank you and i hope you all enjoyed it once again inshallah we'll see you on the next live story thank you that's not that